the most interesting feature of Plato's Republic is that all of the arts that are described in Plato's Republic that are the centerpiece of the training of the philosopher king are, of course, arithmetic, geometry, solid geometry, uh, astronomy, harmony. But he says, unless you can see the kinship between these, you have to see the kinship between these. And two words, you have to see the kinship and the community of these. And with Plato, what you have to do then is to consider these the central ideas in the whole education and go back and do your reading all over again, focusing everywhere you can for how he uses these two terms. You will find that in Plato's Republic, he has many levels each of these levels correspond to what is called the divided line. So therefore, there's the image thinking, the image thinking which is the lowest, and it's a special kind of image thinking because the kind of image thinking that is produced as a result of certain people who stand behind those figures in the cave carrying objects on their head, and the objects that they carry on their head is absolutely essential to understand because it's the images of those objects that produces these images, which the people in the cave take to be the very nature of their reality. And therefore, since they are, in fact, the models, and these are the copies, model, copy, then these man-made things are the things we have to focus on in order to understand this great image of Plato's divided line. Now, this whole thing is nothing other than a copy of a model. For this is the model, the first two steps. And that, of course, is the realm of knowledge, state of knowledge, and understanding. And these two stand to the same degree that these two have stood. That is, model, copy. Why am I saying this? Because when you go back and look at the idea of kinship and community, you will see that he's using these words in these four areas in a slightly different way. And you have to appreciate the difference as these two terms move forward then that'll give you an insight of how these are taken together. When you do that, that opens up the possibility of entering into the law of the mind, which is the dialectic. The goal of the dialectic is in the, it, it's very interesting the way this, uh, this gentleman writes he only uses very few words to describe the most important things in his work, but he'll spend page after page on lesser things. Why? Because the lesser things can be seen as a model copy, and therefore you can take anything that he uses and go back up. So therefore, what is this dialectic? He says, that the primary goal of the dialectic is to move from the idea of the good, now this always must be capitalized, because we know from the past readings that the word idea means not a thought or what we call an idea, but uh, literally that's a Greek word, idea, it means to behold. 
No, it means to behold the good. It would be, therefore, an, a, an experience of what it would be like to experience the good. It's a beholding the good. Now, as we said last time, when this is, in fact, beheld, <clears throat> one encounters this splendid thing as a pure experience of beauty itself. All through the Republic, he uses these images of beauty and beauty itself, and he brings them together here. Then, in that experience of the very nature of the idea of the good, we find, therefore, that he's talking about it in a very interesting way. This has, this realm is the, as he describes it, this is the highest object of knowledge. The last of all to be seen, he says in the allegory of the cave, is this, which is the idea of the good, which in the allegory of the cave is the sun. All right. What does he encounter? He discovers that this is the cause of all the seasons and the years, etc. So therefore, we can go back to what we said previously and bring it together. This is also, therefore, an insight into the very nature of ultimate reality, sometimes called being itself. But since another word for it is mind, it's also the realm of intelligence. And of course, this is what Plotinus picks up and expands upon. And therefore, it's not just something that is being itself an intelligent, it has a vitality, it's not dead, right? Now, this is what one encounters. Therefore, when one experiences it, this is a blissful state. And he says, we mustn't allow what is currently being done in our republic because people who experience this, they want to stay there. This is the islands of the blessed. People get into that state, they want to stay there because that's a blissful state. Now, that means they do not then come out of that state to come back down, as it were, as he describes it, into the cave and help their fellow man. Everything what we must do is when we must apply the dialectic to this in order to see that this is not the ultimate state. Though it is an ultimate experience, it's not an ultimate state. Now, what's the difference between the two? An ultimate experience is the highest type of experience man can have. Therefore, it's something you can go into has a beginning, middle, and end, and it terminates. Therefore, as we talked about it previously, this is somewhat like the uh, Hindu mystics who say that kind of a blissful state is indeed magnificent to achieve, but the samadhi that you can go in and out of is no samadhi at all. Therefore, that presupposes a higher state. How does he get to this higher state and with what kind of reasoning does he apply it? Because dialectic is a kind of reasoning. Now, let me hold that for a moment, go back into the Republic to review a couple of things. This is the highest thing that can be known. This is the highest kind of knowledge. And uh, At the end of book six, I just wanted to sketch it out for you. Similarly, in a similar way with things known. The good is not only the cause of their being known, right? It's the cause of their being known. It's also the cause that knowledge exists. And it's also the cause of the, this highest state of knowledge. 
this is a state of knowledge. State means it continues independently of the person perceiving it. And as a consequence, those who experience it recognize that knowledge exists, <clears throat> has an ongoing existence always, and it's also the cause of the thing, the thing being known. Therefore, it provides, in essence, this, this magnificent thing here, it provides the truth for the things being known, and it also offers the power of knowing to the knower. It gives power to the person knowing. <clears throat> This is this, sometimes called the idea of the good, or <clears throat> the good itself. It's also the cause of all right and beautiful things. Because since this is beauty itself, anything that participates in it, participates to the degree that it can in beauty. Since it's the very nature of reality, it allows things to be just the way they are, perfectly, and that's what it is to be right. So therefore, this, the idea of the good, is therefore the cause of right and beautiful things. But it's also, this idea, this experience, discloses something quite remarkable in the book seven. <clears throat> it's the it is, in fact, the cause of the sun in our visible world and sunlight. See, this can be described as a most radiant, right, luminosity, sometimes called pure light. That's the way he describes it in the Phaedrus, pure light. So therefore, that uh, source of all light is for Plato. That's the very cause of our light, the sun, and sunlight in our visible world. So therefore, what place does the good have if it's beyond the idea of the good? Well, he says, look here. As magnificent as all of these things are, he says, the good, it transcends these things, transcends them entirely in both dignity and in power. Hmm. <coughs> now, how can a dialectic, therefore, work on this kind of thing? Well, picking up where we were before, and pushing it, we can make a couple of statements. And let me give a model first. I'm going to draw a picture of the soul. As you can see, it's a very beautiful soul. soul participates in mind. I'm going to symbolize participate with a pi. The soul participates in mind, in mind. And like anything that participates in something or possesses a characteristic of something, that something must stand prior to the thing itself. So, in that sense, um, if a particular thing has a, quali has a quality of <clears throat> yellow, the characteristic yellow, is something that that pad in some way joins, participates in, has, possesses, and therefore it shares in a certain kind of yellowness, not pure yellow, and therefore 
for that to do it means there must be something independent of that which it shares into and therefore it must necessarily be prior to it. Therefore, if the soul participates in mind, the mind itself must be prior to it. Now, therefore, that participation in mind itself is the cause of the soul's knowing. For without the mind, there would be no cause of knowing. There would be no knowing. Now, we can make several interesting points from this. And one is that this, the particular soul, the particular soul, must in some way be able to participate in this mind, and the mind itself must allow that participation. So therefore, uh, one participates, the other allows the participation or has the power to allow it. So one participates in that which is participated in, and the participated allows the participation. Let's do this now. We said these things together can be a way of talking about the idea of the good. Now, if the idea of the good then can be said to have these characteristics, or qualities, <clears throat> and if these qualities are hyphenated, that is to say, these qualities do, do not stand as one apart from the other and mix together, but rather is they join together in an interesting kind of unity. So it's a unity of distinguishable parts though they're not separate. Now, I mean, beauty of self, being, intelligence, vitality, right, they're all hyphenated. That's the way you can judge that experience, and also the experience itself is the most beautiful experience possible to man. And all of these things stand together in a unity each is, as it were, hyphenated to show in a certain aspect, a certain uh, way in which we can distinguish using the mind to distinguish these elements within it, but they're not separate and distinct one from the other. Therefore, they have a very fine high degree of unity among them. Oh, by the way, <clears throat> if we then participate in a unity, then that unity must be prior to it. Hey. That means the unity must be prior to it. Logically, yes, prior to it. The unity must be prior. Well, one thing is very clear. There's two things in here we can take a look at. Certainly, for something to have that much beauty, beauty is a, as a, an immediacy to it, a very powerful sense of itself, and so does vitality. So therefore, would you not agree in this, this unity that pulls all these things together, it looks like there's a participation in power. There's powers present, and being itself, intelligence, that's, that is what is, or what is, what is. So what is and what has power also seems to be present in this experience as a necessary distinguishable mark of uh, the encounter or the experience of the idea of the good. Now, wait a minute. Huh. That's a curious, interesting thing. You see, when we say that something is, we mean that it's definite. It has a den benefit or it's a limit. Right? Right, it has a limit. Power on the other side is indefinite, right? right? 
right, all power being by itself is a homogeneous force, varies in quantity but not in kind. Now, just make a slight shift. Plato in the Philebus says that all things that exist have as their origin the one. But before you can talk about how things participate in the one, he says you have to break it up into their constituent parts. That's the very power of dialectic. You have to be able to see if you're going from one to many that there is a definite number of things between the two that you have to account for. Therefore, in the Philebus, he says, you know, <clears throat> the one in generating and creating all things, the first thing that emerges is limit. Limit. Or definiteness. In the Greek, it's definiteness. And the other is the unlimited, sometimes described as infinite power or indefinite, if infinite indefiniteness. Some translations have it very well. They talk about it in another language, which I also like, bound, determined, and boundless. Now, therefore, since the one, the idea of the one and the good, one is identical with the good, and of course, Proclus's 13th proposition establishes that with great rigor. And the difference between the one and the good is that the good is that which all men desire, <clears throat> and therefore it's a, it has a power of attraction that all people are attracted to. But in terms of using the term the one, that's a cognitive term, and that's the highest perception you can have, and therefore you go between the desire for the good and the highest intellectual concept you can have. So therefore, the one, in generating all things, first generates this duad, dual, this duad as they call it, the limit, the unlimited, or the bound and the boundless, or the definite and the infinite. <clears throat> now, then these two, as metaphysical, this is a kind of metaphysical cosmology, these two come together, these two come together, and where they mix, the overlapping, that's what he calls in the time is being. So we're coming to the same conclusion, you see. What is prior to being, we're saying over here, is the definite and indefinite, or the bound and the boundless, same thing as over here. So we reach the same things, either by the Philebus or by reflecting on the Republic. Now, how will that help us? Well, we can take off some of this. That's how it can help. We should have more than one blackboard. Now look here. Suppose now we look at this and say, oh, the idea of the good is identical with the good itself. Well, remember we said that the idea of the good is the same as the idea of the one, so just to unpack what this means as one, right, clearly in the purest sense it must not be a plurality or a manyness. I'll use manyness since Right. Can't be a manyness. If it can't be a manyness, then it can not, neither be a whole. Can't be a whole. Can't have parts because if it's a whole, it would have many parts. If it has parts, then that would already mean that it's a manyness, so it can't be either. 
and therefore anything that has a beginning, middle, and end would equally have parts, so therefore it can't have a beginning, middle, and end. And anything that is, that has any shape, must have a beginning, middle, and end, because you can define anything, the shape of anything, in terms of a straight line and a circle, since any kind of a figure is a combination of the two. And both straight lines and circles have beginning, middle, and ends, and therefore a beginning, middle, and end is denied of the one, Obviously, it must be formless. <clears throat> well, if it's formless, then we can say a few things about it. One is we can say, if it's truly formless, could it be the same as anything? Well, if two things are formless, how can you talk about them being different? Look here, if they are two things, if something is the same as itself, or if it's the same as anything else, then it must stand in some sense and be measured by itself, and that would be two. Ah, oh, manyness, no manyness, no manyness. So we can ask the same question in terms of same, other. Can the one be other than something? If there's something other than the one, it couldn't be a one. You'd be then talking about it in respect to other things. And we only want to talk about a pure one. So you can't use the word same and other. But nor in the same way can you talk about motion and rest, nor can you talk about similar and dissimilar. Because if it's, a, if it's in motion, then there must be several places in which it must be, and there presupposes there must be something in which it is, a space, and therefore you have a multiplicity. It can't therefore be in motion or at rest. To be in the same place as it is presupposes that you can talk about a place continuing over time, and therefore that presupposes place must be plural, and we're only talking about one, not many, so it can't have any of these qualities. Well, it can't be younger and older than itself, nor can you have any opinion of it or perception of it since it has no form. So in that sense, it cannot be regarded in any way as an object of knowledge. or opinion, or perception. Now, would you not agree, if we're now going using this as this idea, now we go to our idea of the good. If I say that X exists, am I not attributing existence to something? If I'm saying X exists, then I have existence plus the thing, too. That can't, that's out. Right. Oh, by the way, if I say the idea of the good exists, then I must admit that I'm talking about something that has at least more than one. And if it has more than one, it's not a pure one that we've defined. Oh, <laughs> if all of these things are together in that splendid unity, Say, unity, another word for unity, is oneness. Now, wait a minute. If there's such a thing as redness, that means the quality of red, the quality of red, is the thing we're talking about. So, if anything has redness, we would say then that presupposes there's a red. Wait a minute. If there is a oneness that presupposes prior to that there must be a one. If there's a unity, if many things are brought together in a unity, then the condition for those things together coming together as a unity must be the prior existence of a one. So therefore anything that has a unity can't be the same as the one for the one must be prior to unity. Oh, now, if that's the case, we might be able to say then that if the idea of the good and the good are exactly the same, then we either have a false idea of the idea of the good or the, or the good itself. But if we hold to this definition of the good, and take these things as what we just described as the idea of the good, then obviously it cannot be true that the idea of the good is the same as the good itself. 
No. Let's try another one. We said a moment ago that that admits of a plurality or a manyness. Well, why don't we say that manyness is primary? We turn it around and say, look here, this is just a prejudice to take the one as an absolute term, as if it has to be the most prior term, prior term, and having greater dignity and power. Why don't we just say the manyness is prior to the one? and switch it around. Because anyone who experiences this experiences an overwhelming state, and one of the specific marks of this is that when one, one is in it, it is inconceivable how anything could be more fantastically beautiful, more real, and more mind than what it is they experience. It's impossible to conceive of such a thing. Therefore, why don't we turn it around and say, no, 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 that's really the fundamental pr principle, and the one is just simply an arbitrary concept we, con we brought together. And the manyness, therefore, is most real and fundamental. All right, we turn it around. Oh, by the way, if we were to say that uh, there is such a manyness and it's prior to the one, then <clears throat> we have to look at this idea of manyness. Would you agree, if there is a manyness or a plurality, there must be many ones? Because if something is going to be many, there has to be many of it. Well, therefore, that presupposes there must be this curious thing in it that exists, of which there are many. And therefore, there must be many ones prior to one. But wait a minute, does that make any sense? Didn't we say from what we were looking at before that if anything has a characteristic, see what we said? Anything that has a characteristics or a quality, then those characteristics and qualities which they have must exist independent and prior to the thing that has them. Well, if that's true then, then the many has these characteristics, ones, and therefore the ones, therefore, must be prior to it, not prior to the one. Therefore, by that reasoning, the idea of the manyness being primary, we must reject. Now, let's turn it around and try it again. Look here. Could we not say that both Plurality, or manyness, both pl plurality exists, <clears throat> but the one does not, just a concept. But by that same reasoning, if we mean by many ones to be many, therefore there wouldn't be a plurality unless there were one, so we can't say that either. Huh. Well, perhaps we can say that uh, there is, of course we could say there's neither plurality nor one, but that would be foolish because we see ones wherever we look. Therefore, the idea, let's try this one. So let us say plurality participate, uh, no, let me turn, turn around first. The one participates in a plurality or manyness. Well, if the one did, then each of the things we call plural, then the one participates in it. Each of these things would then have a one. Since it participates in it, then we'd have, good heavens, we'd have a, if the one participates in a plurality, it itself would be a plurality and not one, since there'd be many ones. So we have to reject that. That's not going to go anywhere. Well, you know what we might be able to do? Might be able to raise this question. Is it possible to turn it around and say, is this possible? That the plurality, or manyness, uh, the manyness 
participates in the one. Now, what would that mean? <clears throat> well, that would mean there's a one, and then manyness, whatever the things are, If it participates in the one, then to that degree it is one, since it participates in it. Well, if it participates in it, that means it must have the power to do so, and it must be able to participate in it to the degree to which it is capable. Equally well, it means the one itself must allow it, permit it, endure it, or allow the condition for participation to exist. If that's the case, then if the manyness are participating in the one, as we have here, right, each one of these things to the degree that participates in the one, then to that degree it can share in a oneness and so it can share in a oneness then the condition for being or having a unity is met. It is dependent upon the one. Hmm. Well, if our reasoning is correct then, the condition for this to be a unity, the condition for that being a unity or having a unity is dependent upon something prior and that is the one itself. Hmm. Now, let's look here. We have a chain here. Let's see whether we can say something more other than prior. All right. If this <clears throat> can be the cause of this, and this can be the cause of this, then the first cause is the cause of The second principle is only the cause of, so therefore whatever is a principle must by necessity have a greater range and be responsible for a greater line of causation that something is other than and that follows the one. Well, look here. If the one therefore generated the second, and the second is this. And he's calling that itself the cause of, in the visible world, the sun, sunlight, and of things being known, and the fact that they can be known and that knowledge exists. Well, then it's a very powerful cause as it moves from the second to the third. But would you agree, no matter how productive it is, by necessity, what was prior to it and the source of its own existence must have a greater power and must be a more fundamental cause. Therefore, by this reasoning, the one is not only prior logically, but it must have necessarily more power and must be more fundamental as a cause in the fact that it is able to sweep a greater number as it proceeds. So if these are successfully different levels of causes until we finally get to can openers, chewing gum and bubble gum, 
then whatever exists as existing here, the prior must therefore be its cause, and so on until you get to the one itself. If so, then, the one not only has greater power and fundamentally a greater cause, but it must also have a greater scope. Scope meaning the widest range of its influence. Well, therefore, as we compare the idea of the good and the good itself, the good, we can say, must certainly be the cause, more fundamental, prior to it, greater in terms of power and scope and in terms of causes, more fundamental. Therefore, we can say that's also the first principle. Now, suppose someone were to say, now, look here, first principle. No, 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 no. Why can't you have it that instead of one principle, you have many principles to begin with to account for the vast plurality that exists? They can say, okay. By the way, if there are many principles, then each one must be a one. And therefore, there's likely to be one idea which runs through all of those many principles by virtue of which can account for the fact that there are many. If that's the case, then, there must be a one commonness to it all, which is prior to it, and must be its cause. Therefore, we got to throw out the idea that there could be anything other than the first cause in the way in which we're reasoning. Therefore, the first principle, therefore, can equally stand as a term to describe the one or the uh, good. Now, uh, <coughs> I wanted to run through this, but I had a particular point I wanted to make and I wrote it on a piece of paper. Um, it was a new thought I had, and I wrote it down. Um, hmm. Well, I wrote it down. <laughs> the wrong piece of paper, it looks like. I don't know. Um, well, I can recall it. Okay? Here it is. I want to go back to this image here that we were developing. This person at this moment is experiencing this, this vast vision, which in the symposium he calls the perfection of beauty. And in the Rouse translation, he calls it gaining a vision of the nature of reality. Now, that means then that we have within us, we have within us a power to participate in that experience. That experience itself must be open to us to participate into it. That means then that since we are participating since at this moment this person is participating in what we have called being itself intelligence or vitality, another word for this the ancients used is mind.
Therefore, man has a power to participate in that experience. The experience itself must be open to us to participate in it. And through that participation, we gain the power to know. Therefore, the thing that we participate in is mind itself. Now, here's where we separate our thought from ancient thought. We want to say in our language that we have minds, we possess the mind. In this game, we don't possess it, we participate in it. And as a consequence, this person now, through this experience, is now aware of something new, and that is the vastness, the profundity of mind. In Plato, he says, this gives birth into the individual the power of knowing. This experience then gives them the power to know. And that power to know, the nature of mind, has no boundaries, has no boundaries, boundless, boundless, for it's the nature of ultimate reality. Yet, in some way, we can still talk about it. Therefore, in that sense, it has a definiteness to it. And it also has a vast power. Ah, that brings us back to what we said before, that the one then, the first dual principle that emerges is definiteness. Remember, we called it about a definiteness. Another word we called it is bound, limit, See, anything that you can describe is its limit, is its limit. This description describes it, and therefore you've established a boundary around it insofar as you can describe it. But it, its vastness, its vastness is unbounded. It's unbounded. Sometimes called the infinite or the unlimited. If that's the case, all right, then the presuppositions of this experience are these duals. And therefore, beyond this experience, as blissful as it is and beatific as it is and ecstatic as it is as an experience, there must be something then prior to it and prior to it. Therefore, that is, in reality, the third. So I have taken you through what I regard as a kind of quick exploration of a dialectic on the idea of the good and the good itself in Plato's Republic. With a little bit of Philebus, a little bit of Symposium, I'll throw it open. Mm. What I did to that piece of paper. Mm. I missed the conclusion at the end uh, where you said, therefore, that's the big one and that's the big two. And that's the big two. I, I didn't hear it. Uh, I missed your conclusion at the end where you put the number of numerals on there. When you, Put up two, Roman numeral two. Yes. And you said, therefore, one is numeral one. Oh, oh, oh. Because we have reason before that the first generative thing that emerges from the one is a principle called a duality. And these are the two things that are described in Plato's Philebus as the two that emerges from the one. And both of these are presupposed in this experience. Therefore, turning to the idea of what's prior, 
then we can say one, two, three in terms of uh, prior majesty, etc. So is all mind the one? So is all mind the no numeral numeral one? Well, um, see, this comes partially from Aristotle. Aristotle thought that the highest term was mind. And so, actually, Plato or Platonists come back and they say, um, let's see, if you mean mind, then it's something definite. It does exist. It has a boundary. It has, must have a unity, etc., etc. And then they build up a dialectic like this to show that it must be a term derived from something prior to it. Yes, same thing. Doesn't that contradict then the, the, the concept of the royal couple where the queen... Thank you. The queen. This is uh, in the Republic. This is the king. This is said to be the queen. That's right. And what you're pointing out is that we found something between the king and the queen. He didn't cover that. I sneaked that in. That's yours? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's in the five leaders, you know. So, but, uh, Wouldn't but, it just be a third royal pair? Yeah. Wouldn't it be a third royal pair, the bound and the unlimited? Another king and queen? Well, mm. it would have to be. Um, um, The way in which uh, Proclus reasons about this is to say, um, he gets cagey at this point, but nonetheless he's saying, these are the conditions for that. I'm saying, yeah, that's true, it's the conditions for it by the same reasoning. Why not say it has some mode of existence? And if it has some mode of existence, in principle, it should be an object of experience or encounter or participating in some way. Yeah. But there's no being, is there? Yeah. No, in no, the there's above being. So then there isn't any way of experiencing it then. Well, it, that's right, it's beyond experience. But that's why you then use the next language and say encounter uh -huh. or, allow so, it, or allow it or something like that in order to get out of that so language. So what, what, what would you be doing if you're encountering that? If you're not experiencing it, what would you be doing? Well, see, uh, as we said before, the, any idea of experience must have a beginning, middle, and end. It has a termination beginning. By necessity, that then, can't. none. Right. That right. Can't. It would be, have to be a continuous presence. Presence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, we're playing together on this. This is, this is not in play, though. So the dialectic then gets you to bound and bound, unbounded. The dialectic can get you to that. And, and you're saying that the dialectic can also get you to the one. Which yeah. Is good. yeah, we're using a dialectic to go this way. Uh, get my figures straight. Hmm. But in the Republic, he goes, No, good, good, good. As I drink all of this in, um, it seems to me that in some manner I am the good, knowing itself, getting to know itself. Mm -hmm. From this point on, the language is so precise that you may make conclusions from the language you use rather than the thought you're trying to express through a language. <laughs> so, you say, I am the good, you see, 
you have to be careful about that language and communicate it with certain kind of con precision because that assumes there is um, is this, do we put this in the beginning of sentences but because we've been taught to and to capitalize it? Like you can't have an English sentence without a subject and therefore we stick it in there because of the laws of grammar? Is that, is that necessary for the thought you're raising? Could you just as equally say, one? Yeah, it strikes me that one is, no, is knowing itself. If it knows itself, there must be a knowing. There must be something known and a knower that's doing it. So, so, so this is beyond that kind of meta so yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let me read this very interesting section in six again. The good is not only the cause of their being known, but the cause that knowledge exists and of the state of knowledge. Although the good is not itself a state of knowledge, but something transcending it, far beyond it, in dignity and power. There's a better way of putting that quote. But the cause that they are, the cause of their state of being, although the good is not itself a state of being. That would be an alternate translation of that line I just read. What's the cause that they are? The cause of their state of being, although the good is itself not a state of being. Because then you'd be adding to it existence, you see. And it's two. Then it exists. You're adding something to it. You're saying something about it. That's a characteristic. If it has a characteristic, then that particular characteristic must be independent of it. And it must be something it shares and participates in, and therefore it must be prior. Motion and rest, no. If the one, if the one could be at rest, it would have to be at the same place in which it is more than once. To be in a state of rest means it has to stay there. So you have to have the idea of place in which it is, in some sense, that it remains there for long enough for you to say that there's a continuity between those two. Well, how many do we have now? Just one, or space, place, continuous? So therefore, if this idea presupposes a whole set of terms, then we're not talking about the one, we're talking about something regarded <coughs> as a manuscript. If it, if it is in motion, then it must be a series of points, as it were, that it translates through. And there must be a place from which it started and a place in which it terminates. And it must pass through all of the points between those two. And we say, good heavens, we got a heck of a lot of manynesses in that one. So to talk about it as moving presupposes we're in a universe not of one, but of many. No rest, no motion. Try this one. Hey, maybe we can say the one is in itself. <laughs> yeah, we got it now. We're safe, we can say something about it finally. This is, wait a minute, wait a minute. If anything is in itself, 
there must be some place in which it is and there must be something that has a boundary such that it can be in itself and therefore there must be something that's passive and active, something that holds it to where it is, right? It must be in itself and therefore there has to be a self in which it is in and there has to be some container that allows it to be in. One, two, three, four, gone. Can't say in itself either. So the minute you say one is, though, the is already, doesn't that already get you into trouble? That's right. Because that's assuming it has existence. Because there are things we can say that we can talk about that don't have existence, and therefore we can say we can't say that they are. That's the use of the word is as existent, as indicating existential qualities. There's another use of the word is that it doesn't have that, it's just to put in there as a, 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 as a grammatical point, not implying any existence. And in Greek, there's a way of writing the Greek where, where that distinction is made on an accent over esteem. And uh, um, there's a whole discussion in the Greek world about whether or not that is true or not, and all experts are arguing about whether or not that slight difference in accent marks makes that difference, but it is accepted by some and argued by others. And therefore, in truth, when this dialogue is concluded strictly, you can say, therefore, that you can't even name it the one, because there's nothing there you can define in such a way as to call it one. And therefore, it's without, it's unnamed. Ah, oh, no name now. And that's one of the names of the one, the unmentionable. I was reading some poetry this guy referenced the Buddha, and he had a footnote on it. So I read the footnote, and he said, Buddha said that uh, a person being could participate in the good and therefore be redeemed. I don't know if that's a correct definition, but was he really was he really saying like you could just take number three and be redeemed? What that's what it does. does. That's where all that language goes, the number three. That's right. What does he oh, mean? Yeah. What does he mean when he says redeemed? What does that mean? Well of course I, I don't know whether they even have that kind of a word, since it's a you know it's a Greek philosophical term. Yeah. I've heard the word before, but I don't know what it means. Redeem. Well, it may have a loose meaning, which we all know, like you can redeem something for something else. But I thought. Uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Your worldly soul is redeemed for a. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that language usually goes with the idea of repentance. Right? You are redeemed if there is a repentance. So and there is a repentance only if there is a forgiveness of sins. That's, that's and that's only possible if there's a freedom from it, according to the theology, isn't it? Right? Well, that's going down you know, Catholicism and Christianism. But I mean, up here, if you have a state of awareness of you know, this beautiful, intelligent, vital, are you redeemed? Yes, then the idea of being redeemed wouldn't make too much sense. Before it might, but now there's nothing to redeem. If one encounters that the very nature of oneself is mind itself, or the nature of ultimate reality itself, and that we are capable of participating in that, then there is nothing blocking us but our own ignorance from participating in it, and that's why we need more, more and better teachers and better systems that can bring us to it. There might be a redemption in the sense that you're free. You're free of the illusions of what of what you thought yourself was before. I mean, if you if you encounter that kind of a re ultimate reality, it might it might redeem you from false belief. That's that's very correct because the idea of illusion in in Greek is really the word true. To be removed from illusion is true. And the very idea of, of truth, aletheia, 
is when someone naturally develops the, uh, the beautiful art called recollection, because then they are recalling, remembering. And truth in the Greek means aletheia, which means not to forget, not forgetting. Not forgetting is to remember. To remember is being able to recollect. Yeah, I don't know whether you're familiar with that. No. Is encountering the one allowing the one, is that absolutely random? Or are there techniques towards, towards having more of those encounters? Is there any way of having more? Encounters of the one. No. Or is, that's, it, is it just um, wholly random? It just happens? Why it happened today and not yesterday? I don't know. Well, there is so little in, in this. You see, there's quite a bit of information on this. It is possible for people to encounter this spontaneously. In Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, he says there are five ways you can get in this. You know, different ways of doing it. One, by the way, is through childbirth. He says, I'll get you there. Yeah, you've got to drop everything for those people who are able to do it. You drop everything and let it, let it happen. Bang! Might slip into this. He also says, by the way, drugs. So I'm not arguing for that. Uh, Burke, the great Burke, who wrote the great book called Cosmic Consciousness, he describes leaving a party one evening after reading poetry with some friends, a nice evening, a cup of coffee, walking down the street and <laughs> stepped into this. And I think you know some Hindu saints who were said to be able to get in in this that just overpowers them, overpowers them at certain times. Yet yeah, we're saying that there's samadhi and then there's also this, this encounter with the one. Yeah. That, that mm -hmm. kind of, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's something that's beyond a vibrancy almost. It's uh, yes. Uh, if you're, yeah, have you ever encountered the one? That's difficult. That's a very difficult question. But let, let me give you a, a, a classic way of representing it. Right? In the ox herding pictures, the eighth ox herding picture, it's just that. And uh, certain commentaries say that's this total complete experience. And then there's the ninth and the tenth. And the tenth is that great picture from which we uh, get the term Dharma bone. If you're familiar with the ox herding pictures, uh, he leaves the, the village and he's got a gorg and he's got all his belongings on his shoulder and he's, he's shabbily dressed and there's dust all over him and he's got suit on his face and he's smiling and and without even caring to, he uh, brings to enlightenment uh, fishmongers and innkeepers uh, without even trying. That's, that, that's the... He's just in it. But see, uh, I had a friend of mine who was once with a Roshi, a very famous Roshi, going through him some dokusan, private interviews. And, uh, this chap had a very profound experience, so he said to the Roshi, look here, he said, no. if you're in this experience and you're eating a hamburger, would you stop eating it until you got to your elbow? <laughs> like, would you know, no differences, see, there are no different, overwhelming experience, no differences, therefore whatever you're doing, you'd continue doing, you wouldn't know that continuing doing it might be dangerous. This is not. This is just a, uh, an extremely, the most profound state of uh, naturalness. So, um, Have you encountered the one? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I got him off the track. Did you see that? I was clever for a while. I thought I got away with it. Guys, see the trouble with people have good memories? You think Thank it's you. possible? Yeah, I'm going to. Because you think it's possible to encounter the one? I thought the whole... The whole 
point of this whole thing was was that the only experience we can have is at level three we might be able to uh, we don't have an experience of the bound and the boundless but you but you might have some what would you have see if you're not having an experience what are you having see, um, see. I thought, thought the only way to approach the one was through the dialectic, and that's, that's an inferential... Yes, that's true, but the, the dialectic um, should open up into what they uh, um, call an epibola, I believe. Uh, I wrote it down somewhere once. Um, I don't know where it is. It was on that slip of paper. Um, um, Uh, this is a pure vision, epipolon, right? That comes out of news, which is uh, opening the mind to see the nature of the truth. The dialectic, therefore, as we said before, allows you to recognize, therefore, a higher mode of... Uh, as a matter of fact, there's several places in the Republic where he says, uh, you don't have mind, you gain it from this experience, you participate in it, right? Now, when that, when he talks about that, that's this word. This leads to this, which is pure vision. So when you, so then you can have a pure vision of the one? Is that theoretical? See, so long as we, we if, you ac if you put a lot of accent on the vision, then you're still making a dis right. dis distinction. Right, I see too. That's why the most curious feature about this is that the people who encounter it often say the same thing about it and that is they go around saying hey you know what uh, it was there all the time didn't say it was obvious as hell it was obvious as my own hand in front of my face and i didn't recognize it i mean what you know, they're astonished they're astonished about the fact that there's nothing to see right? that there's nothing to experience per se it has to be as natural and available and omnipresent, always present. Now go ahead and ask him again. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I don't know. It's just, uh, um, oh my God, you're crying. You were ready. Huh? To, I just thought you might be ready to. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, too comfortable talking about myself. Has good encountered the good? Um, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll shift gears. I'll talk about this. Uh, I have been fortunate to have been here several times. And uh, as a matter of fact, I can say this to you, okay, in all fairness, because I don't want to dodge it too much. But some. Um, I lived those, you see, I was here. And it was inconceivable, totally inconceivable that could be anything else. I mean, it's totally, I mean, if anyone came up to me and said, you know, it's not bad, but there's something beyond it. That two would be things honest. beyond it. Yeah, well, they forget the two, just one. <laughs> yeah, just laugh, just laugh at the person, they don't know what they're talking about. Inconceivable, it's inconceivable that anything would be greater than this. And you're right. It's inconceivable there can be any greater experience than this, but there's something beyond experience. And that's, that's uh, rather, that, that will certainly bring you a chuckle in life. Gee, I have a pretty, couple of pretty nasty dreams over this one, huh? Mm-hmm. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank you very Thank much. You. That was